I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. I will worship you until the very end. I will worship you until the very end. Thank you, Lon. Isn't God amazing? Any bit of time you get to spend with him, it just refreshes us from the inside out, doesn't it? God is good. Good to be with you today. I had a chance to be away uh, for a week as a family, and we just wanted to thank uh, Pastor Harvey Fry. That's so, such a wonderful gift to be able to go away as a family and uh, know that Pastor Harvey's here. And uh, thankful for his ministry and his words of wisdom, walking us through uh, discouragement in the life of Joseph uh, last week. I'm just so thankful for who he is as a man and his ministry to us as a church family. And the, the way he feels belonging here is uh, just a real blessing to us as well. And so we thank the Lord for that and thank Pastor Harv for this last week as, uh, as he was here in our stead. I want to take a moment and pray as we prepare our hearts to come to the Word, and uh, today we're going to talk about, and this is going to sound a little odd, but the worst prayer ever prayed. We're going to talk about the worst prayer ever prayed, but the beauty of it is that we can learn some things out of it. And so let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. Lord, we come to you right now on your terms, not because of our righteousness or our worthiness or our family background or our training or whatever it may be. Lord, we come to you on your terms right now. We come to you based on the gift of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. The fact that he became our sin and nailed it to the cross. Lord, we come to you this morning in light of the resurrection. That Christ is alive. And as we've connected with him in his crucifixion, we connect with him through faith in his resurrection, and we are made alive. And so, God, we ask you to speak now in your word. Your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Come and divide to our hearts and speak to us, God, and, and bring life where there's death. Bring newness where there is things that are old that need to pass away. Lord, bring truth where there is error. Lord, by your grace, we respond to you. Won't you soften our hearts, open our ears to hear, and our eyes to see. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the worst prayer that's ever been prayed. You know, as we, we think about this amazing gift that is prayer, connection with God, where the God of the universe, through the gift of his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who died in our place, invites us to put our faith and trust in him, be cleansed in his presence, and come near to him. That, that we can draw near to him, and he promises he draws near to us. And this gift of prayer, this privilege of prayer, is this privilege of connection and communion. But if we're honest this morning, could, could we raise a hand if, if you've ever in your, your journey with God, if you've struggled with prayer? Yeah, probably almost all of us, you know, one way or another, as we've taken this journey. You know, prayer is such a gift and such a privilege, but prayer is also, in a sense, a mystery. Uh, prayer, in a way, can be a struggle. You know, prayer can be um, work. You know, depending on how we approach it and, and what we've done with it, what we understand of it, it can be challenging. 
I remember, and I know I've shared this at some point, but I can remember my most passionate prayer as a young man before Jesus really got a hold of me and woke me up a little bit to who he really is. I remember praying and praying and praying when I was in elementary school for a four-wheeler. I mean, you think about the passion behind a prayer like that for an elementary school-aged boy. Jesus, I need a four-wheeler, you know? And he didn't answer that prayer, so I'm alive and with you today because God had a plan because he knew what would happen if I had a four-wheeler. Um, but, you know, we, we pray sometimes. We get these things all backwards and inside out and upside down. And, and uh, this morning I want to talk a little bit. And, and I sense we're going to begin a little bit of a journey together here in this, that we're going to talk about the worst prayer ever prayed. But out of that, realize what human nature's response is to the presence of Jesus and how we can combat that in our own lives as we look at prayer. Leonard Ravenhill says, the true church. Now again, the church isn't a building, it's not a Sunday gathering, the church is believers, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit. We're the, the, the body of Christ, the church. The true church lives and moves and has its being in prayer. The true church lives and moves and has its being in prayer. And again, prayer is this connection, this communion, this conversation with God. Now, I think most everyone raised their hands, you know, that at some point or maybe now, you know, there's struggles with prayer. We need to grow more in prayer. There's things we don't understand about prayer. Prayer sometimes is harder work than we know it should be, you know, before the Lord. And sometimes that can be a a guilt thing then, you know, that prayer can feel a little bit like drudgery, but we know we shouldn't and it's such a gift and, and all those kind of things come and weigh down on us. Well, I want to remind us out of the scripture that uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27 tells us that we do not know how to pray. You know, because we can, we can take on shame about that. And you think, well, you know, yeah, I'm going to put my hand up because I've struggled, but I know I shouldn't struggle. I know prayer should be easy. Well, the Bible tells us we don't know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit is given to us to help us in our weakness. So God says, yeah, I saw your hands and I knew that before you put your hand up, right? That we don't know how to pray, but he's given us his spirit to help us in our weakness. So God, God is the motivation of our prayer. He's the power of our prayer. He's the inspiration of our prayer. He's everything in prayer. And so he wants to enable us in that and his grace and the power of his spirit so we can have hope in that. You know, in one sense, and I've, I've told people this, you know, is is they're new to the things of God. I've told people time and time again over the years in the churches that we've had the privilege of serving in that, hey, you know, prayer is easy. Prayer is simple. You know, just speak to God. Don't worry about saying flowery language and the these, vows, and hitherto's and sounding, sounding like a Shakespearean sonnet when you speak to God. We don't need that. Just speak from the heart. And I, I've told people time and time again that prayer is easy. But in another sense... It's not, in another sense. You know, I've told people that, well, you know, you you can't do it wrong, just just talk to him. Well, we're going to look at a prayer that was wrong, (laughs) just done wrong, and see what we can learn from it, what God's telling us. We're going to look at the worst prayer ever prayed. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 37, Story out of the Gospel of Luke, uh, the historical account of Jesus' life and his ministry here on earth. And we see this show up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I just happened to pick uh, Luke's Gospel with some of what it shows in this account of uh, Jesus dealing with uh, the man that was filled with demons from the region of the Gerasenes. I'll have New American Standard up on the board, but please feel free to turn in your Bibles. There's Bibles under the seats here and there. If you don't have a Bible but you'd like to follow along with one, look under the seats around you or in front of you. There's some Bibles. Or if you've got a phone with a Bible app, please feel free to follow along. The Scripture says, Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Then they sailed, Jesus and the disciples, they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but living in the tombs. We've touched on this passage here and there over the years, and so I'm not going to belabor it, but I'm going to walk through it so we can set the stage of this prayer that comes forth that is the worst prayer that's ever been prayed. And so we see Jesus come off the boat from the region of Galilee over to the region of the Gerasenes. And he's met when he comes off the boat with the disciples of a man who is possessed by demons, the scripture says. 
You know, the scripture doesn't mix words. You know, we're not, we're not putting some sort of different label on this guy, you know, and trying to figure out what's going on, whether it's spiritual or physical or, or emotional or whatever. The Bible says he was possessed by demons. People can be possessed by demons by then. Back then, they can be possessed by demons now. Amen? And so this man came out, and he was possessed by demons. He had not put on clothing for a long time. He was living in the tombs, the place of the dead. Seeing Jesus, verse 28, he cried out and fell before him and cried out in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. The demonic powers fully recognize the authority of Jesus. And I wrote myself a little note here, do I? And as we think about prayer, what prayer really is, and in this journey that I sense we're going to end up taking uh, about prayer and the way the Lord teaches us to pray, do I recognize the authority of Jesus Christ the way the demons recognize the authority of Jesus Christ? That's one of the foundations of prayer recognizing who Jesus is. So immediately the demons reacted to Jesus' presence, and the man fell on his face, and they cried out with a loud voice, Jesus, Son of God, what do we have to do with each other? I beg you to not torment us. Verse 29, Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. He was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. A desperate situation that this man's in. The worst situation humanly possible here on earth. So Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. Now they were imploring Jesus not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter into the swine, and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. They saw Jesus work, and they went and told everybody. And that's a good thing. I mean, that's, that sounds like shouting time, right, Lonnie? Sounds like shouting time. Somebody's given testimony. You know, they saw the work of Jesus Christ, and they went into the city, and they went all over the country, and they told everybody what Jesus had done. The people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. And so they went and they they shared the good news, what we would call the good news, the power of the gospel. Jesus had moved. He would, you know, just like we sang at the beginning of the service, he had set men free. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And this man who was naked and running through the tombs and had cut himself, the other gospels say, and and he would cry out with a loud shriek and he'd break chains when he was tied up and, and put in shackles. This man was clothed and sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind, and all the people came out to see what had happened in response to the people's message and testimony. And so then the people are there, and they're seeing the man sitting there, and the the others that had witnessed this were telling them the story, and this is the demon-possessed man, and now he's made well. And you think, man, this is a praise Jesus time. Jesus' presence is here. The kingdom of God is here. Verse 37, and all... Do you think the Bible exaggerates? Of course not, right? It's the eternal truth of God. All the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with fear, and Jesus got into a boat and returned. They made request of the Lord. They petitioned him to leave them. The worst prayer that has ever been prayed. You think, well, that's... That's crazy. You know, they see this miracle and this demon is cast out and this man is set free and they saw the power of God displayed right before them through Jesus, the Son of God. And their response instead of praise is they ask him to leave. Lord, leave. Leave this area. Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 5 that speak of this account as well says they implored Jesus, they begged Jesus to leave their region. 
the worst prayer that was ever prayed. They asked the Lord to leave them. Now notice, they didn't say, you know what, we don't, we don't believe in you. We don't believe you're the Son of God. They didn't say that. You know, they, they didn't say, you know what, hey, okay, we're hearing the story about the demon stuff. We're not buying it. You know, we know you and, and Bubba here out of the tombs, you guys made a little plan and tried to put on a little display, but we're not buying what you're selling. You know, they didn't, they didn't say that. You know, they didn't make any statement of disbelief in Jesus. They just implored Jesus, petitioned Jesus, prayed that Jesus would go be Jesus somewhere else in another region away from them. They didn't deny who he was or what he was doing. They didn't deny the kingdom of God. They didn't deny the miraculous power. They just didn't want it around them. The worst prayer that's ever been prayed. So why? Why this sad prayer, Jesus, go away? Why was that their, was that their response? You know, what did Jesus do to get this kind of reaction from all the people of the region and surrounding district? I want to take a moment and just walk through what happened here a little bit and make some observations. Because Jesus' presence was there. You know, Jesus was there. His presence was there. And so what, what was unacceptable about Jesus' presence to these herdsmen, to all the people in the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district? Well, Jesus' presence challenges comfort. Jesus' presence challenges comfort. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, when he got off the boat and he was confronted with this, he was confronted with the status quo, and Jesus disrupted the status quo. Now, I know using even the term status quo is kind of status quo, so we can just let that go in one ear and out the other, but what is, what is normal here? What were the people comfortable with? What they were comfortable with was pigs and lots of them, and a demon guy who ran around naked and cut himself from the tombs. Who, when they tied to, tried to tie him up or, or chain him up, he'd break those bonds. That was their normal. Now, normal is pretty relative, right, for each of us. All of us in here have a different normal for our life. Sometimes, you know, when you've had your life intersect with other lives and you start to see the way somebody else does something, or if you've ever been married, right, and two worlds intersect, you realize that normals can be very different between people. What's normal for one and is not normal for another. Well, what is their status quo? What is their normal? Pigs and demons, all right? So they were comfortable with their status quo. They were comfortable with their normal. Anybody spend any time around a pig farm? Pigs have a unique smell. As an outsider who has not spent much time around pigs, pigs have a unique smell. Pigs ratcheted up for me a few notches from cows, right? In horses, horses is a friendly animal smell. You know, our daughters love horses. And when they come home from Whispering Hope Horse Ranch and they have the smell of horse on them, it's endearing. And then a, ratcheting up a few steps is cows when it's hot out and the cow odoriferousness <laughs> is permeating the atmosphere. But ratcheting up about a thousand notches is pigs. I don't know if you're in agreement with me or not. That might just be a me thing. So what is their normal? Pig stink. Right? Pig stink. That's their normal. What's, that's their status quo. What's their status quo? Demons. Demonic activity. Demonic pig stink. That's their status quo. And I'm being a little obnoxious, but I'm making a point here, right? Jesus had to go. He had to be somewhere else. They didn't deny who he was. They didn't deny the miracle, but they were making this request of him, Lord, you be you elsewhere, away from us, because we are uncomfortable with the disruption of our status quo, even if our status quo is demonic stink. And I know that that's ridiculous, but that shows up in lives around us, doesn't it? Lord, this may be hell on earth, but I'm comfortable with it. It's what I know. It's what I understand. I realize where I fit in this. 
And Jesus comes on the scene and he's confronted with the smell in the air, if he's me. He's confronted with the smell in the air and this demon man that comes in front of him and he, the finger of God hits the scene and, and the kingdom of God is manifested and the man is set free and the, the pigs go in. The, and I know there was livelihood that was impacted by the kids going, the, the kids. <laughs> Sorry, Faith. The, <laughs> the pigs going in the, uh, the lake and drowning. I know there was financial impact to the herdsmen as a result of that. But God showed up. God worked a miracle, but yet he had to go. The worst prayer that was ever prayed, Lord, leave this place. Leave our lives. Because comfort was disrupted. We are a culture that is drunk with comfort. We're drunk on comfort. Myself included. A while back, uh, we were in one of the big sports stores down in Saginaw. I don't remember which one it was, but I had the pleasure of sitting in my first um, zero-gravity chair, those little recliner folding chairs, if you've ever seen a zero-gravity chair. Sat in one, I thought, ooh, Jesus, this is your arms. You know, I can feel you holding me. I really like this chair, and I'd comment on it and stuff, so I, I think maybe it was Father's Day, I don't remember, but uh, my wife and kids got that for me for uh, Father's Day or my birthday, I can't remember, and so the zero-gravity chair, now if you can picture these things, it's like a, it's like a folding chair that's a recliner, kind of, and the zero-gravity chair may from time to time, or maybe more often than that, show up in our living room. I don't know if it's made for outside, probably, but it shows up in our living room, because it's like my little redneck recliner, you know? <laughs> We're, we're obsessed with comfort. I like that chair. I was just sitting again the other night in our living room. Uh, we're obsessed with comfort. And it shows up in a lot of different ways in our life, and some silly and some not so funny. That we get very comfortable with what is status quo, what we know, what we're familiar with, even if what we're familiar with has the smell of the demonic on it, the smell of bondage and slavery. The smell of the world. You know, if you've experienced challenging someone else with the truth, the holiness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're challenging issues in their life, you know what I mean. You know, even if these things are so damaging to them, these addictive behaviors or antichrist attitudes, whatever it may be, if you begin to challenge them with the truth of God and the freedom that he's calling them to, most often you will have a fight on your hands. Because even if that status quo is damaging in his demonic stink, it's still what I'm comfortable with. And don't take it from me. But Jesus will always challenge it. His presence will always confront that in our lives and lives of those around us, through us by His grace. He will always confront it. And their response was, Jesus, go be Jesus somewhere else. So Jesus' presence challenges comfort. Jesus' presence also challenges control. Control. When Jesus cast those demons out, the pigs took a plunge, the man was, was restored to wholeness, and the people were frightened. The scripture says several times in this passage, the people were frightened. They were out of control. Something beyond the physical was taking place. Something they couldn't manage. Something they couldn't contain. Something they couldn't put in a box. Something they couldn't define. Something they couldn't predict. Something they couldn't estimate what the, what the cost would be. Jesus showed up. The kingdom of God came and things changed. They were out of control. Many times when control in a life is challenged... Control for that life will be fought for. Jesus will be invited to leave. It's human nature. And so we just need to be aware of what could be inside of us so we don't miss out on the presence of God and this, this connection that God calls us to in a life of prayer, a life of, of fruitfulness for the kingdom, of life of His will being done in us and through us as it is in heaven. We can't control our lives. God has created you through the adventure of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be out of control. You are created to be out of control. Now, some of us can think of Lonnie's stories up here, right, that he was telling at the beginning of service. But man, now, of course, we can make anything a, a humanistic display to get attention for ourselves. But there is something beautiful about worship and praise that takes us beyond what we're comfortable with into what we feel he deserves. 
not only in a corporate worship setting, but as a lifestyle beyond what I am comfortable with and what I can manage and control into what he is worthy of? Can we think in terms, in our li- can we think of our life and our, our daily interactions and our five-year plan or whatever it may be, our long-term goals, can we think in terms of not what can I control, but what, if it, what is he worthy of? Of what is God worthy? And that will require me relinquishing control. Because any time we take God, and, and think about what these people witnessed, They witnessed a man who had been tormented and tormented them. Otherwise, why would they have tried to bind him in chains if he was not a torment to the culture? They saw this man who was tormented and also was tormenting others through demonic power, demonic possession, completely set free. They witnessed this miracle, like I'm sure none of them had seen before. And instead of relishing in the fact that there was something beyond the physical, something metaphysical that was taking place, something beyond the natural, something supernatural that was taking place, and just sit back and enjoy it. They tried to control it. We've got to get our life back in control. Jesus, you've got to go. Anytime that that we try to control who God is, that we try to box him in and have this God thing figured out, we will come to the realization, hopefully by God's grace, that any time we try to box God in, he's no longer in the box, just we are. Any time I think I've got God figured out, and you can ask people who are close to me, it's not infrequent, if I'm honest. I think I've got the God thing figured out. I think I know what he's doing here. I think I know what's coming next. I I think I got God. I think I got God. I think I got God. And I get this thing all hemmed in, all pretty, all under control. And I realize that I'm in this box by myself because God cannot be contained. Some of us need to hear that this morning. You've got this thing hemmed in and nice and clean. But if you'd allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes... You're in that box by yourself. Now, what God's hope and and intention is that you'd allow him to put on the combat boot and kick down the door. That God would kick the door off that thing. That God would blow those walls out and open this thing up so that you and he can experience who he really is. That we give up control. Allow God to be God. Jesus' presence challenges comfort. Jesus' presence challenges control. Jesus' presence challenges cash. Jesus' presence challenges cash. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when Jesus cast out the demons into the herd of pigs, the, the swine went down the, the bank into the lake, and the Scripture says they were drowned. So there was a loss of revenue, right? There was a loss of money. Uh, for those herdsmen, whoever owned the pigs. There was a loss there. And with that loss came the prayer, Jesus, get out. Does Jesus have ownership of your money? I don't need ownership of your money. The church doesn't need ownership of your money, but Jesus does. You know, the things that you have had entrusted to you as a steward. Jesus' presence challenges all that. When Jesus is near, we can't, we can't hide away our money. We can't hide away our assets. We can't hide away our material possessions. We can't hide away our time and say, okay, man, Jesus, you're great. I love what you're doing there. I love casting out those demons. That pig thing was pretty cool. This is mine, though. It doesn't work. It's impossible. Jesus' presence challenges that. It challenges our assets, challenges our control of our cash and those things that we've been created as a steward of. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly that the breath in our lungs belongs to him. It goes as far as to say, if he withdrew it, you would die. The scripture tells us that. If Jesus called his breath back to himself that he has put on loan to you for this time on earth, you would die. 
If Jesus owns the breath that is in your lungs in this moment, and you are a mere caretaker, a steward of that breath to do his will while you breathe here on earth, how much more so your material possessions? And I'm not telling you to sow your thousand dollar seed and all that antichrist nonsense from the pit of hell. That TV stuff is garbage. That's not biblical stewardship. But biblical stewardship is He owns everything that you have. You only have what you have because of His grace poured out abundantly into your life and into my life. He has given you the abilities that you have. He's given you the tenacity to pursue a career. He's given you systems of provision around you. Think of God's generosity. Just because you were born where you were born compared to being born in a different part of the world. God's absolute generosity that he has entrusted extreme wealth to you and I compared to most of the world that we could honor him with that wealth while we have breath in our lungs till we meet him face to face. Jesus' presence challenges our cash because rightly said, it's his, his cash. Jesus' presence stirs that up within us. All that is His that He has entrusted to our care, His presence will challenge us to honor Him in those areas. And some of us have problems there. In Jesus, yeah, we believe. We know you do miracles. You do good stuff. Just do it elsewhere, please. When it comes to money. When it comes to my retirement fund, when it comes to my vacation spending, when it comes to my hobbies, when it comes to my list could go on and on and on. Jesus, you're, you're great. We, we, don't, we don't disbelieve. We just want you to be Jesus over there. Lord, will you be Jesus in my health, but not, not my money? Leave my bank account alone. Jesus, we, will you be Jesus in my marriage, but not my hobbies? You know, I need my space. I need my stuff. And we can, if we're not careful, come in line with the worst prayer ever prayed. Lord, leave. Go be Jesus elsewhere, in a different region, in a different area. And Jesus answered the prayer. That's terrifying. Jesus listened to their prayer. He got in the boat and he left. When Jesus was exercising his authority over their cash, over their assets, he had to go. That's an interesting statement for America in 2018. When Jesus exercised his authority over those swine, which was their assets, their system of wealth, their monetary goods, their system of provision, when Jesus exercised his authority over them and they were drowned in the lake, Jesus had to go. We've got to let him visit us in the area of our finances, our planning, our spending. Jesus has to be honored with what he's entrusted to your care. would have been hard to accomplish, men, what some of you have been able to accomplish without breath in your lungs that God gave you, huh? And it's great to have a sense of pride and accomplishment, but may it rest humbly in the presence of God of pride and a sense of accomplishment in what the Lord has done through our life. May he receive the glory and may his kingdom be impacted through my life and through your life. It would have been really hard to accomplish what you've accomplished without breath. Jesus' presence challenges comfort, control, cash, and their career. Now, I wanted to differentiate. I was wrestling with this a little bit last night, but I felt it was worth differentiating. Their cash, meaning their, their assets, those things that were entrusted to them when the pigs went in, their career was their identity, what they knew, how they fit into the culture, where they were in the society, what their expertise was, everything they were that identified them. Jesus' presence challenged it. They knew their job. It was an expression of their success, their ability to accomplish something. Jesus' presence messes with all that. So they requested that he go be Jesus away from them. They needed some distance. 
between them and Jesus. The worst prayer ever prayed, Jesus, leave our region, go away from me. But let's look at a great prayer, a great prayer that follows this. Looking back in uh, Luke chapter 8, verse, uh, we stopped at verse 37. Verse 37, it won't be on the board, but just to reread, says, All the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked Jesus, they asked the Lord to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. But verse 38 and 39, the next verse, But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him, begging Jesus, that he might accompany him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe the great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city the great things Jesus had done for him. So we see the worst prayer ever prayed, Jesus, leave. Jesus, leave us. You go be Jesus somewhere else. And we see this amazing prayer that, that is kind of the antidote to that. That he's, Jesus, I beg you, where you go, I want to go. What you're doing, I want to do. What you're, what you're up to, I want to be a part of it. Jesus, I want to be where you are. That was the prayer of the man who was set free from the demons. You bet. Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to do what you're doing. I want to be about your business. So this amazing prayer was prayed and and looking at face value, it can, it can look like, well, Jesus kind of answered the, the request of the demons and sent them into the pigs, and he certainly answered the request of the people when he was leaving the region, and now this guy prays a real God prayer, a real Jesus prayer. He prays a great prayer, and it looks like at face value that Jesus wouldn't answer it. He tells him no, but when you look at what Jesus told him and then what the man did, he got his prayer answered. Jesus, I want to be with you. I want to do what you're doing. I want to be about your business. Everywhere you go, I want to be there, Lord. And he sends him on mission in his name to spread his truth. And he went throughout the region, the Bible says, telling everybody the good things that God had done for him, the miracles that he had done. I want to take a moment and look at one other example while we have a few minutes here. An example of another horrible horrible prayer that we see in the scripture. Looking at Luke 18, Jesus tells us a parable. The scripture says in Luke 18 verse 9, Jesus also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. They looked down on others spiritually. He says in verse 10 of Luke 18, two men went up to the temple to pray into the place of the presence of God. Right at that time, they went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, in the other, a tax collector. Again, tax collectors being looked at as the worst sinners of that culture. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I pay tithes of all I get. That's one of the worst prayers ever prayed. And Jesus is going to point that out. The tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but he was beating his chest, beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went to his house justified, standing righteous before God, rather than the Pharisee, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I just want to look at two other characteristics here of what Jesus' presence challenges. Jesus' presence challenges our credentials. Jesus' presence challenges our credentials. This Pharisee was bringing his credentials, his spiritual pedigree, his spiritual upbringing, his background, his accomplishments. He was bringing that to the presence of God as a badge that he was wearing before him. As if this somehow um, earned God's ear in prayer, or this somehow earned God's answer in prayer. Jesus' presence will challenge our credentials, what we think we bring to the table, our accomplishments, our background, what we've done. It's worthless. It is all worthless. We have no credentials. We have nothing to bring to the table until we realize that it's only through Christ that real fruit comes. Jesus' presence challenges our credentials. If we're, if we're not careful, human nature in the best intending heart, will come to God in prayer 
focused on self and our worthiness. And that can be a double-edged sword. If we don't deal with that kind of spiritual pride, then we will either be arrogant in his presence and he will turn a deaf ear to us, or we will be so so self-deprecating and false humility in his presence that prayer will be absolute drudgery. We can't rightly experience the joy and ongoing fulfillment of prayer if we have anything in us that advertises our own credentials. It will either come out in false humility, in unworthiness and lack of ability to forgive ourselves, or spiritual pride and arrogance before him. So Jesus' presence challenges our credentials. And Jesus' presence, lastly, challenges our character. He challenges our character. Because remember, the last story I shared from 10 chapters earlier, Jesus' presence challenges our cash, our stewardship issues. Well, this Pharisee says, I fast twice a week and I tithe everything I get. Well, doesn't that mean I don't have a stewardship issue? The Pharisee would say. I tithe out of everything I get. Just as God commands, giving 10% of what God has given him. But God's presence, Jesus' presence, challenges our character. Why? Why we do what we do. The true me hidden inside. Why was the Pharisee tithing out of self-righteousness as he brought his credentials before the Lord and advertised his righteousness before a holy God? As ridiculous as that is. And it showed his character. Jesus' presence will challenge our character. Why do we fast? Why do we give? Why do we do good stuff? But wrong motive made it sin. Wrong motives makes the best of stuff sin before God because it violates his character and his nature, his will for us. Jesus' presence challenges our credentials and challenges our character. But let's look at this great prayer again. This man, this tax collector, standing some distance away, not even feeling worthy in himself to come near the presence of God. He was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He was dependent upon God's grace alone. And he was justified before a holy God. Will you stand with me? Now remember in the Gospels, we, we see Jesus' disciples, his followers, interacting with Jesus for three and a half years in his earthly ministry, his public ministry. And Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, you read the Gospel of Mark, and all it is is just like a, a machine gun of miracles from one end to the other. He just did miracle after miracle. You know, the, the disciples were there when, when Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, and we see the recognition in the Gospels of people saying, you know, he doesn't teach like our teachers, like our scribes, like our Pharisees, like our experts in the law. He teaches as one with authority, you know, out of the presence of God. And they saw his teaching and his preaching. They saw the miracles. But we don't see recorded in the Scripture the disciples saying, oh, you know, Jesus, teach us to do miracles. Or Jesus, teach us to preach like that after they heard the Sermon on the Mount. What do we hear the disciples saying? Lord, teach us to pray. You know, we don't know how to pray. God fully recognizes it in the Scripture. He tells us in Romans 8, we don't know how to pray. And if we're not careful, we'll end up coming in line with these, the worst prayers ever prayed. Because it's the human heart. Lord, I don't know how to pray. And he's asked by his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And his response has come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. And I want to put up out of the Scripture, out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and following, I want to put up the Lord's Prayer. And some of you, of course, have been reciting this for years and years and years. Others, this will be new to you. But I'd like to go ahead and pray the Lord's Prayer together in response to this desire to learn to pray. I sense that God's going to take us on a, a journey together of just learning to pray. And listening to what he's saying when he says, pray then this way. Can we pray the Lord's Prayer together? Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we thank you. We humbly thank you that you invite us to be a people of prayer, meaning a people of your presence. But we know, Lord, that humanly speaking, your presence is very confrontational. Lord, we know that that stirs up a lot of things in our lives. And so there's, there's this human temptation in our flesh, Lord, to invite you to go be Lord in other areas. But God, we don't want to maintain control. Lord, we don't want to be comfortable with the status quo that many times has that demonic stink on it. Lord, help us to be released, to be who you've created us to be. And Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray, God. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we come before you. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you richly in his presence as we continue to to press into who he is to be a people of prayer. So take his presence to the nations. Amen.